Hey friend, it is your Creative Weird Makeup Artist Pal Cat Sketch to bring you guys another character in my Twisted Wizard of Oz series. We are almost complete, but I had to do Glinda from Oz. Since she is a good witch, which is our known for bubble bubble, toil and trouble, and she descends upon the land of Oz in this beautiful pink bubble, I thought I would do a little play on bubbles and boils with Glinda while talking about some of the major differences between the book and the movie, I went deep diving into old fan journals that I found online of people that really studied the movie and the book and all the differences. I grew up reading the book, so this is super fascinating and interesting to me, and I hope you enjoy it too. So let's turn into Glinda. Today, we're gonna to do a comparison between the book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and its most famous movie adaptation, the 1939 MGM movie, The Wizard of Oz. Since the structures of book and movie are pretty similar, though the movie is more driven as a story, it roughly hits the same plot points in the same chronological order. We're gonna go through the story point by point and compare them individually to see what works better in the movie and what works better in the book. Let's begin in Kansas. Both the book and the movie begin on a small farm in Kansas, which is in the book described as gray, dreary, and dull. The movie quite ingeniously reflects this by presenting all the scenes in Kansas and sepia tones, just like a lot of the movies were back then. It's a really neat trick, made even neater by the fact that the entire opening, including the roaring MGM lion in the very beginning, are presented purely in sepia tones, giving the impression that this is a black and white film. This not only plays up the contrast between the gray Kansas and the colorful land of Oz, it also makes the first Oz scene a genuine visual shock with its bright colors and really drives in the point that we're in a completely different world. Unfortunately, despite this very clear, clever bit of film technique, the Kansas scenes are among the weakest parts of the movie. Now, the book knows that it's not Kansas that's the interesting place here and spends only enough time there to introduce the setting and its inhabitants. Basically, what we learn is that Kansas is dull, harsh, and a very gray place. Dorothy's aunt and uncle live a very hard life here and never laugh. And the only thing that has stopped little Dorothy from turning as gray and hopeless as everything else is that she has Toto, her dog, to play with and take care of before starting the plot and transporting Dorothy to a much more interesting Oz. The movie, of course, as a visual medium, can introduce the characters and themes as easily and neatly as the book can. And of course, it makes sense that it would need a little more establishing time to get the message across. Now, what's good here is that Auntie M and Uncle Henry get a bit more characterization in the movie than in the book. Not very much in either, and they even get a couple of pretty funny lines. Auntie M gets the real laugh of the movie with her angry, I've been waiting 23 years to tell you what I think of you and now, well, being a Christian woman, I can't say it. But the problem is the movie dwells too long in Kansas, adding a whole new plot line that wasn't in the book, which admittedly could have worked, but it just doesn't. In the book, Dorothy is perfectly content on the farm despite the hardships, while in the movie, where the hardships are downplayed a lot, she becomes a lot like a more modernized Disney princess and dreams of a better place, as exemplified in her establishing I Want song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Now it's a good song, and it does set up for some character development for Dorothy that she lacks in the book, but ultimately it underlines another flaw in the movie, which is Dorothy herself. Dorothy in the movie is, there's no way to put this nicely, she's a crybaby. I don't know whether to put the blame on Judy Garland or the scriptwriters, but in the movie, Dorothy more often than not comes across as a pathetic and helpless whiner. Only occasionally in scenes where she gets angry does she show some semblance of a backbone, but far too often she just sounds on the verge of tears for no reason. This is a big contrast to the paramatic and cheerful Dorothy in the book, 
who keeps her calm in most situations, who seldom complains and only cries if she actually has something to cry about. You can make the argument that Dorothy of the book doesn't really develop or grow in any way, whereas her movie counterpart does. But really, the growth she goes through doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Interesting enough, Ruthie Plumley Thompson, the successor of L. Frank Baum, disliked the studio's casting of Judy Garland as Dorothy and wanted Shirley Temple to play her. Now, why MGM went with Judy Garland instead, no one knows. There's been conflicting stories, but we can't help but wonder if Shirley Temple wouldn't have been a better choice. Temple was 11 years old at the time, and much closer to how Dorothy is supposed to be. Garland was 16, and although they try to make her look younger for the movie by taping her breasts flat, she really doesn't look anything but like a teenager, which makes her crybaby tendencies even worse. Maybe Dorothy would have been better off if Shirley Temple had played her, but that's something we will never know. And Toto is actually pretty much the same in the book and in the movie. But then really there's not that much to alter about him. For the most part, he just tags along with others and doesn't make much of himself. But he has occasional moments where he directly affects the plot. In both the book and the movie, it's because of him that Dorothy is whisked away to Oz in the first place. In the book, she's trying to save him from a cyclone. In the movie, she's just trying to save him from the mean Miss Gulch. And in both versions, it's also thanks to him that the wizard is revealed as a fraud. He's an occasional plot mover, as well as a target of affection and concern for Dorothy, rather than a character in his own right. Though he is a cute one, this doesn't really change between the two versions. Now the movie introduces five new characters who aren't in the books all of whom have had their parallels in the Land of Oz and are played by the same actors. The mean and nasty Miss Gulch, also known as the Wicked Witch of the West, the good-hearted charlatan Professor Marvel, the wizard, and the three farmhands, Hunk, Hickory, and Zeke. The Scarecrow, also the Tin Man, and they also play the Cowardly Lion. There's not much to say about the farmhand. They don't add a whole lot of story, except their presence does show that Auntie M and Uncle Henry are considerably more well off in the movie than in the book. In the book, they are very poor and they wouldn't have been able to afford farmhands, much less a nice big farmhouse with nice furniture like we see in the movie. Zeke is the only one of the farmhands that's in any sort of sympathetic way Hunk mainly just sneers and Hickory gets so little characterization, he might as well not have been there at all. Most important though, is the mean and nasty Miss Gulch, who wants to take Toto away from Dorothy because she's just mean and nasty. Well, allegedly it's because Toto bit her leg, but people don't buy that. Threatening with sheriffs and lawsuits, but the dog escapes and runs back. Now, so far so good, if we'd gone directly from there to the cyclone, it wouldn't have been a problem, and it would have even worked quite well. Adding another layer to the story that isn't in the book, even if Dorothy and Toto didn't make it back to Kansas, Toto's life would still be in danger. However, here comes the movie's first misstep, the Professor Marvel scene. While on the run, Dorothy and Toto meet up with the phony soothsayer Professor Marvel, who immediately guesses that they are running away and who guesses that it's because Dorothy feels unappreciated at home and wants to see new places. Dorothy agrees, except that's not why she ran away at all, is it? She ran away because she was afraid Miss Gulch would kill Toto. Yes, she sang that over the rainbow song. She gave no indication that she wanted to run away before Toto was in danger. But now it's like she completely has forgotten that part. At least she does nothing to inform Professor Marvel about this vital detail. And the scriptwriters seem to have forgotten about the threat to Toto as well, because it's never mentioned again for the whole duration of the movie. Since Dorothy seems to suffer some weird amnesia about why she ran away in the first place, Professor Marvel manages to convince her to return home by playing on her concerns for her Auntie M. 
I don't blame the professor here. He's a smart enough to realize that you can't just run away from your problems, but you can blame the script writers because we need to learn the morale of the movie before the main plot has even started. And then they try to make it seem that she needed to learn it again at the ending. Now the twister scene is much more dramatic in the movie than in the book, but then it contains a scene where Dorothy is knocked unconscious when inside the house and the camera blurs and focuses on her face and then it all turns into a dreamy imagery. Sometimes when you first see this movie, we're hiding our face in our hands saying, great, they're gonna take the entire thing into a dream. Now the thing about this was that MGM apparently thought that the modern public was too sophisticated to accept a real fairy land. So they turned Oz into a dream. And it's to underline this that they include the farmhands, Miss Gulch, and the professor at all, so that the Oz characters can be based on them in Dorothy's dream. This is why some people don't like the parallel angle of the movie. Some people really, really hate it. The, it was all just a dream thing. It hardly ever makes sense for an authentically good ending. There are exceptions such as Alice in Wonderland because Wonderland doesn't make sense at all. It definitely is a dreamland. Now, the arrival in Oz. The scene where Dorothy is shown after her house has landed opens the door of the home and she suddenly finds herself in a glorious technicolor that could have not captured the spirit of the same scene in the book more perfectly. Dorothy's lying, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore is original to the movie, but works so perfectly with the scene that for some time a lot of people thought it was in the book. The grand spectacle of the munchkins put up in the movie is also really well done. A lot of people begin to lose interest around the time when the lollipop guild shows up and the scene begins to drag a bit, but all in all the movie does a good job at portraying the sheer and utter joy of the munchkins over the death of the Wicked Witch of the East and even Judy Garland's semi-permanent expression of the wide-eyed terror that works for this scene. And she really looks completely overwhelmed by everything. The scene in the book has a lot more information, but the scene in the movie has a lot more energy to it. So this part works very well in both versions of the book and the movie. Of course, there's one thing about the scene in the movie that encompasses both one of the most positive and one of the most negative changes made in the story, which is the witches. In the book, the Wicked Witch of the West is barely an antagonist. She doesn't show up until Dorothy and her friends actually visit the West, and then she's only in three chapters of the whole book. In the movie, the Wicked Witch takes the scene right away and establishes herself as the villain of the story. From here on, just about everything bad that's happened to Dorothy on her journey will be the direct or indirect result of the Wicked Witch working against her, both in order to get revenge for the death of her sister and to get her hands on the magical ruby slippers. The Wicked Witch of the movie is a much stronger antagonist than the Wicked Witch of the book, and it doesn't hurt that Margaret Hamilton is clearly having a lot of fun with the role being unashamedly a gleeful, wicked witch. However, the other witch in the movie, who is Glinda, she is the second worst thing about the movie to some people. Everything about her is wrong to some. From her voice to her mannerisms, to her so obviously fake cheerfulness, not to mention that the fact that she is combining two perfectly decent characters from the book not only completely ruins both of them, but really and unnecessarily messes up the plot. Because in the book, the Nameless Witch of the North is the one who gives Dorothy the silver shoes that's shown in the book, not the ruby red in the movie, and advises her to go to the Emerald City. She knows that the shoes have some powerful charm to them, but doesn't know exactly what this charm is. And she so honestly advises Dorothy to the best of her ability. She also gives Dorothy a kiss in her forehead, which leaves a mark and protects her against evil forces. So you can't say she doesn't try to help Dorothy at her best. Glinda, who is in the book, is the Witch of the South. 
She's the one who knows what power lies in the shoes. But since she's not present at the time and doesn't actually appear until the last part of the book, she couldn't very well be expected to tell Dorothy sooner. But the Glinda of the movie turns out to have known the entire time that the ruby slippers, that they changed color for the movie because red looked more striking than silver. But these shoes could have taken Dorothy back home whenever she wanted. She also knew perfectly well that the surviving of the Wicked Witch would be after the shoes and that Dorothy would be in grave danger as long as she had the shoes with her, which makes it doubtfully awful of her to not tell. And why doesn't she? Because for some reason she thought that Dorothy needed to learn a lesson about there being no place like home? Never mind that Dorothy had already learned that, the very same lesson from her encounter with the professor before she even got to the Land of Oz. The Glinda in the movie is either completely clueless or incredibly sadistic. But let's leave Glinda alone for now, we'll get back to her later, and follow Dorothy on her journey to Emerald City. And here is where the movie really picks up because the three traveling companions are the highlights of both the book and the movie. They're the ones who give the story a personality and character development. And even if it seems from the summary that they're not all that important to the plot, they're what makes the story interesting and enjoyable. But going through the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Coward the Lion, we'll have to wait until next time. I hope you guys enjoyed this look of me turning into Glinda with these boils on her face that remind me of the pink bubble that Glinda descends upon Oz in, or just the catchy boiling, boiling, toiling trouble of most witches. I hope you guys enjoyed this. All the products I use in this video will be listed down below along with crediting all the amazing journals I found online. We are gonna continue talking about the differences between the movie and the book in the next video. We're gonna turn into another character, so stay tuned. I am so excited. I hope you are too. Thank you all so much for watching and supporting me. You can follow me on all my social medias. I will see you guys soon in the next video. I am so completely excited. I hope you are too. And I will talk to you then. Love y'all. Bye.